Hey, would you stand with us, uh, stand with me as we read God's word today just to honor scripture. Our text is in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 1. If you've got your Bibles or on your phones, it'll be on the screen. Follow along with me. Chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. This is God's word. You may be seated. I just want to start by saying I had a pretty incredible week this week. I don't know about you. My week was incredible because I was studying for this text and my family knew it. And all throughout the week, my 18-year-old son and my 15-year-old daughter and my 11-year-old daughter, they would say little comments like, Dad, that, that sounded a little judgmental. <laughs> so uh, this has been a work in sanctification. In the section right before our reading today in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, Jesus answered this question. How do we deal with the stuff we don't like about our lives? There are things that take place over the course of our lives that we don't like, stuff that makes us uncomfortable, things that we would rather not experience. And when we have those moments, the way in which we deal with them varies How do we deal with financial stress or putting food on the table or being in uncomfortable settings, the problems in your life that you feel like there is just no way out of? And what we do as a common experience in humanity is that we experience worry and anxiety. But Jesus tells you and me, you don't have to worry. You can trust God with those things. The Father loves you. You can surrender your anxieties to him. He says, seek first. God's kingdom and his righteousness, and he will take care of the rest. So he answers the question, how do we deal with the stuff that we don't like about our lives? And in our text today, just right after that section in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 and 34, Jesus answers a different question, and that is, how do we deal with the stuff we don't like about other people? And this is an important question, because Uh, You have a problem, and I have a problem. And that is that there are people alive on this planet right now that you don't like. And there are people on this planet right now that I don't like. And that is a problem because we're not supposed to not like people. We're supposed to love everybody. We're supposed to be God's agents of love and grace and forgiveness on this earth. People who bring the kingdom of light where there is darkness. We're supposed to serve and to love, to bring healing, to be salt and to be light. We're supposed to mirror the characteristics of Jesus, to be the aroma of Christ everywhere we go in a world that smells like death, to be people with a self-sacrificial prioritizing others over me kind of love as a sign and a wonder to the broken world around us. How are you doing with that? It's easy to get along with and extend grace to people that you love or like, but what about the people that you don't like? People who are different, people who vote differently than you, people who don't worship like you, people who don't live like you, people who don't like the same things that you like. In fact, they love the things you hate and they hate the things you love, the big stuff and the small stuff, like people who stop at yellow lights, (laughs) people who run red lights, guilty, people who don't go on green because they're busy doing something on their phone, people who drop their post-grad work into every conversation that you have, even though you're not talking about their post-grad work. People who always interrupt or people who always take the credit 
You know, for me, it's like people who chew loudly, like mouth noises. It's just like, I, I'm guilty of it as well, though. That's the thing. People who couldn't show up on time to an appointment if their life depended on it. People who complain all the time or people who are lazy or people who laugh at stuff that's not that funny. What do you do with those kinds of people? What about them? And what about the people who are fundamentally opposed to everything that you value as good and right and beautiful? We may smile and we may nod in public, but inwardly we have this deep disdain and contempt. Contempt has become the operating system of our culture. Robert C. Solomon, a philosopher at the University of Texas, Austin, said it like this. Resentment is anger directed toward a higher status individual. Anger is directed toward an equal status individual. Contempt is directed, uh, anger directed toward a lower status individual. Contempt categorically devalues people and it justifies its anger. This creates a dynamic of power and superiority from which most relationships never recover. Every exercise of power incorporates a faint, almost imperceptible element of contempt for those over whom the power is exercised. One can dominate another human soul only if one despises the person one is subjugating. When contempt becomes the operating system of a society, disdain can become dangerous. All atrocities, including the Holocaust and the Rwandan genocide, started by lowering the value of others and justifying the right to dismiss and ultimately destroy them. On a global scale, it feels at times as if we are redlining. This is the cultural moment that we are living in. It's as if we're just like a hair trigger away from complete and catastrophic social deterioration, especially within the American church, because now everything, every issue is polarizing, everything. And I'm not gonna get into it today. I'm just gonna stay away from that. So Jesus addresses the question in our text today, how are we supposed to deal with the stuff that we don't like about other people? Good morning and welcome to Wood's Edge. This is an important text to wrestle with because this spirit of judgment and superiority and contempt has the potential to destroy the kind of bride that Jesus is coming back for. And that is the kind of bride, the kind of people that Woods Edge, that we desire to be, a people of love and grace and forgiveness. And, and so in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus begins by saying, do not judge or you too will be judged. Now, the word judge there is the, word, the Greek word krino, and krino has a large semantic range, and so I just want to be very clear about the type of krino that Jesus is using in this text. Jesus is using krino here to mean to pass judgment, to express an opinion about, to criticize, to find fault with, or to condemn. When Jesus says, do not judge, he is challenging the ways in which we criticize and evaluate and express opinions about, find fault with, and draw conclusions about, and often condemn others based on our limited perception. It's when we unfairly make definitive statements about the motives of someone else's heart. When you judge someone, you insinuate how much better you are because you haven't done the terrible things that the other person has done. And by your own comparison, you are the better, better uh, person. You are superior to them. You look down on them. You stand over them when you judge. Now, you might be thinking, uh, Ben, that's a, that's a little harsh. Uh, I'm just a critical person. I just tell it like it is. I'm a straight shooter. I can be the same. Maybe that's the truth, or maybe you're just judgmental. <laughs> Criticism didn't make it to the list of the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Being a, a, a condemning kind of person or looking for the faults of others aren't some newly identified way of being like Jesus. But this is how the church is known in Western culture. It's so sad that we are known as judgmental hypocrites. Not all of us, not all of us, but th this is what the data shows. 
In fact, Barna uh, surveyed U.S. adults presenting them with 14 possible causes that might make them doubt Christianity. The result was, quote, the hypocrisy of religious people was the most common response by religiously unaffiliated people at 42%, by non-Christians at 24%, and uh, by Christians at 22%. In, in 2019, if you don't like Barna, Lifeway did the same study, and, and they, their study showed that among 23 to 30-year-olds who left the church, 73% said they left the church due to judgmental hypocrisy within the church. I think we've got a problem. Miroslav Volf said, quote, we judge when we exclude the enemy from the community of humans and ourselves from the community of sinners. This is where we are at today. Perhaps you could say it like this, to judge someone is to confuse appearance with identity. It's when we assign moral values based on our, uh, our perception or the appearance of what is going on. And this is a problem because what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, he says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be used against you. What you give out is going to come right back to you. What Jesus is basically doing here is some version of you reap what you sow. Now, this this section where we're at, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 is what we're studying today. If you were to scroll down to verse 12, it's the summary statement that Jesus makes in this entire section. And this is what it says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. So in everything, he's connecting all of the thoughts and summarizing what he's been saying. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. If you were to map verse 2 onto verse 12, it says, if Jesus is saying, judge others as you would want to be judged. Jonathan Pennington says it this way, one must choose how to live in relation to others, and this will affect one's experience of others and even of God. If one has a condemning attitude toward others, this will be one's experience of the world. If one has a welcoming and accepting attitude, this will will be one's experience. So Jesus says, judge others as you would have them judge you. Now, an unfairly critical attitude toward others, combined with a naive lack of self-criticism, threatens to destroy not only the church, it has the, the potential, the potency to destroy you and me. I've heard people say uh, this, this phrase, all healthy things grow. You might have heard that before. All healthy things grow. grow. And that, that is true to some degree. But cancer also grows, and cancer's not healthy. And this type of judgmental attitude that exists within the church is a kind of cancer that Jesus wants to destroy. He wants to obliterate it in the church at large, the church, the global church, and in our own individual lives. He wants to get rid of it. Someone did something that you didn't like, maybe, and it hurt, but it doesn't end there. We feel entitled, this sense of entitlement to go further. This is where project self just goes off the rails. When someone's actions or their speech or their social media post don't measure up to our standards, we make declarative statements about their identity and their worth and their value as a human. Now, we we may respond in in various ways. We may respond like full-on scorched earth, like we just like let them know where they are wrong. Or we may just block them or ignore them in public settings. We can respond in all kinds of different ways. Dallas Willard said it this way, when we condemn another, we really communicate that he or she is in some deep and just possibly irredeemable way bad. Bad as a whole and to be rejected. In our eyes, the condemned is among the discards of human life. He or she is not acceptable. We sentence that person to exclusion. We label them, we lower them, and we exclude them from humanity. We set ourselves up as the judge. Now, we, we all know what this feels like. We've all done this to somebody, every one of us. And the opposite of that is true as well. We all know what it feels like to be on the receiving end of someone's uh, unfair judgment, 
I mean, maybe you said something or did something in response. Someone treated you in such a way that they were just judging you. Uh, what you what you said or what you did or what you didn't say or what you didn't do, but you had this feeling that at a primal level, they were uh, pushing your very identity down in a dehumanizing, destructive way. And as they did this, they, they just raised themselves up. They lowered you. Have anybody... Has anybody experienced anything like that before? Now, what's, what's truly concerning is that when we, when we do this type of thing with other people, when we assume divine responsibility for evaluating the worth and value of an, another human, we are taking God's job. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time and wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. It is dangerous to judge someone unfairly, evaluating their worth, confusing appearances with identity because we just don't know everything. We can't see everything. We can't see into the motivations of someone's heart and mind, but God sees them. He sees what they're doing. You may feel entitled to judge that it's your responsibility, or you may believe that in some warped way that it is your spiritual duty to put people on blast to expose the motives of someone's heart. But it's not, that is not your job. It is not my job. It's God's job. Then Jesus moves to this talk about specks and planks and all of that stuff. Look at verse three. Jesus says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's this huge plank coming out of your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is Jesus' genius on display. He is a master storyteller. Uh, He is the king of kings and he is the king of hyperbole. And that's what he's doing here. Jesus is taking a very serious topic, hypocrisy, and he is couching it inside a physical comedy. He's doing a little bit of stand-up with vivid imagery, like common everyday stuff. Uh, He's acting out this scene with the analogy of a log sticking out of someone's eye. And he uses the word hypocrite, which, which basically Jesus is doing a little bit of theater with the log sticking out of his eye. And he's using a theater term, which is hypocrite, and that means an actor. The genius of Jesus was his ability to connect with the collective human experience. Like literally everyone in the first century and everyone in 2024 knows exactly what it's like to interact with Plank Eye Guy. (laughs) We know it. Got it. Everywhere Plank Eye person goes, they rattle on and on about themselves, what they know, how much they make, you know, all that stuff. In the church, plank eye guy is the person that quotes scripture like in every sentence because they're trying to look more spiritual than they really are and they're trying to make you look less spiritual than you are. It's the person who gives advice to people who haven't asked. It reminds me of the time I walked into a 24-hour fitness when I first started working out. You can tell I, I work out all the time. <laughs> and I possibly should have listened to this guy's advice. But he, when I walked in, it's, it's, a, it's an overweight personal trainer sitting at the front desk, and he says to me, if I could get 15 minutes a day with you for the next six weeks, I could transform your body. (laughs) And I was like, I bet you could. (laughs) I just kept walking. If you can't think of who Plank Eye Guy is, uh, you might wanna ask uh, your friends and family because it might be you. plank of wood protruding from an eye socket would have been extremely obvious to everybody. It, it, everyone can see it. It's painfully obvious to everyone, but the person that has the plank sticking out of their eye. Now, here's the good news. Every single one of us in this room has something in common, and that is that we can think about the person that is being described here. Like, we're all like, yeah, I, I know who you're talking about. I cannot wait to tell them. <laughs> the bad news is, and that we all have this in common is we are all plank eye guy. Every single one of us has blind spots, things that we don't see. We show up to the scene like John Wayne, 
shooting everybody down. Casey Musgraves line, if you hadn't, Casey Musgraves. I'm a massive Casey Musgraves fan. I'm just going to double down right now because <laughs> nobody knows who Casey Musgraves is. She's awesome. Uh, she wrote this line, everyone knows somebody that kills the buzz every time they open up their mouth. You know that person? That's Plink Eye Guy. Jesus is saying that we need to be careful not to judge others unfairly without first considering our own brokenness, our blind spots. Now, the point isn't that all evaluations of others must be avoided, but that we must first evaluate and discern properly and fairly. The point isn't uh, deal with the plank eye guy, you know, like help him get his plank out of his eye, or you deal with your plank eye and then put blindfolds on and just like act like nobody offends with the speech that they use or the things that they do. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying that we can't make distinctions, that we can't say, hey, this is good and that's bad, that we can't use our brains or that we can't use logic but we enter into dangerous territory when we say, hey, you're condemned by God. Or we look at a whole group of people and we're like, they're totally going to hell, all of them. They're gonna burn. <laughs> that is not our job, but that is God's job. So judge others like you would wanna be judged. Take the plank out of your eye first, then help the other person out. That's what Jesus says here. And then the next part is so interesting. He moves into this thing about uh, pigs and dogs and pearls. How is this all connected? Well, let me just recap. To criticize, to, to condemn, to critique, to point out someone's flaws in an unfair way has deep roots in a far more destructive impulse. Perhaps you could say it this way. Judging is when we lower someone and raise ourselves up by correcting, criticizing, shaming, ignoring, or speaking against someone for their behavior or for their unseen motives to control them. I focus on your issues so that I don't have to focus on my issues. I don't have to address my stuff because I just want to focus on your stuff. And sometimes this happens at a subconscious level of which we are completely unaware. I criticize you so you can see how deeply flawed you are and your identity is, which is just control. Or I critique you because I'm trying to change you into something that better serves my purposes, which is control. So in verse six, Jesus says, do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, this is a very interesting text. Like just, I just wanna stop and ask you the question. Pearls and pigs, how, how are you doing with that? <laughs> Y'all doing okay? I, I just, I don't wanna brag, but I have like a really unnatural ability to not throw pearls at pigs. Like, I see pigs not even tempted to throw pearls at them. It's not something that goes through my mind. What's funny is, is this is something that I was never tempted to do until Jesus said I shouldn't do it. And now it's on my mind all the time. So, you know, when you encounter a command of Jesus like this, it's always, it's a good, like, just rule of thought to lean in and to ask yourself the question, is this something that people in the first century were struggling with? Were they just like randomly just throwing pearls at pigs all the time? Like, what is that? That joke didn't work. <laughs> it's really funny in my mind. What is Jesus saying here? This verse, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, has been interpreted and reinterpreted in all kinds of different ways. I just, I just want to recap like the highlight reel. Of, of American commentaries, Western commentaries. There's earliest early church document. Uh, basically, they believed that this verse restricted the unbaptized from receiving communion. That's not, that's not what it says here. Some think that this is Jesus telling his disciples not to share the gospel with the Gentiles, which is completely ridiculous. Like if you haven't read the entire New Testament and, and re read the other sayings of Jesus, this is not, but he's not saying, hey, don't, hey, everybody, don't throw your dog, your, your pearls at pigs and, you know, give the, the holy stuff to the dogs because pigs and, and dogs were considered unholy, unclean animals. Sometimes that was used in that day and age, but that's not what Jesus is saying here. I mean, most of us are probably Gentiles in the room. Thank you that that is not what Jesus was saying. Some think, think that Jesus was saying, uh, don't be pushy in evangelism, which is always a good idea. Maybe that's what he's saying. I don't know. Some suggest Jesus is saying that it's pointless to try to correct people who won't listen, which is also good advice. Maybe that's what he's saying here. Maybe that's a possibility. 
Another interpretation is that Jesus is saying, hey, don't judge people in verses one through five. And then he kind of like reels it back a little bit. And it's like, actually, you know what, everybody, you know, don't judge everybody, but hey, be discerning. And that's what he's saying in verse six, which maybe that's what he, what he is saying here. Uh, but I, I do think there's something else to, to consider. Others think that uh, everything at the, the end of chapter six on anxiety and everything that we've looked at today at the beginning of chapter seven is very connected to the pearls and pigs part. So I just want to, uh, just let's think about this for a moment. First, when we are plagued with anxieties, Jesus asks us to surrender ourselves to God. The natural next step is to surrender others to God. When we don't surrender others to God, we try to control and to manipulate them. Sometimes we try to control people through negative things like judgment, and at other times we try to control people through positive things like pearls. People shift from trying to control you with judgment to control you, and and they shift to trying to control you with good things to get you back in line to do the things the right way according to them. They butter you up. They, they, they give, give gifts with strings attached. How many times have you observed when someone showers someone else with gifts, resources, money, uh, maybe with pearls, and the other person doesn't want it, and they respond in a way that feels charged, intense, or angry, and the giver can't figure out why they are responding in such a reactive way? Maybe it is because their gifts in some way of which they were unaware, were a desire to control and to manipulate. And maybe the person on the receiving end can totally see it clearly, and they are reacting against it. So sometimes we try to control people through negative things like judgment, and sometimes we try to control people through good things like pearls. Jesus says, be careful not to do either. Instead, surrender others to God. So what are we to do with all of this? I think if we look at it closely, it looks like Jesus is inviting us to take three shifts, three shifts that will change us into the type of community and the type of people that bring healing and life and love everywhere we go. Shift number one, he wants us to shift from criticism to, con- uh, from criticism to consecration, from, from speck in other eye, others' eyes management to plank eye amputation. We've got to deal with our own stuff first. When you judge critically and when you set yourself up above someone and put yourself in God's seat, Jesus says, watch out. This thing has a boomerang effect, as Eugene Peterson says. So have, have there been any ways in which you have been judging unfairly? Have you been this kind of person, constantly noticing the faults of other people Condemning, shaming, ignoring, based on their actions, based on what you perceive to be their motivations. Jesus says, be careful. Be careful because you will get stuck in a loop because what goes around comes around. We've got to make the shift from criticism to consecration. Here's what I mean. We, we've got to take the plank out of our own eye first through self-examination, through confession, and through repentance. It's a shift from criticism, which is focused on others, to consecration, which is focused on this attitude of search my heart, oh God. See if there is any wicked way in me. Search my heart. Help me to see my blind spots. It starts with you searching your own heart and life and inviting others from your community, maybe your family, to speak into the ways in which they interact with you. Here's some helpful questions. I just wanna share these with you. I'm gonna rattle through them pretty fast. What is it like to be parented by me? You can ask your children this question. What is it like to be parented by me? You can ask people, what is it like to get emails or texts from me? What's it like to be married to me, to be related to me? What is it like to be in meetings with me? What's it like to work for me? What's it like to work with me? What's it like to be on the sidelines of my kid's game with me? What's it like to be coached by me, to be on a team with me? What's it like to travel with me or to do holidays with me? What's it like to go on a date with me? What's it like to be my friend? What's it like when I correct you? You can start with these questions and ask them. You have to have a heart of humility. It's like, I, I, this is gonna be painful, but I wanna learn, I wanna grow. Uh, this last week, having nothing to do with sermon preparation, I was in a room with five other dudes and we did this exercise where we, list, we self-evaluated 
our strengths and our weaknesses. And we shared those things with one another. And each of the people, the other five guys in the room, as, as one of us went, they got to either affirm, well, they, they, they affirmed the things that they heard us say when we, we self-evaluated. Sometimes they would add something to the list. Like one of the guys said nothing about how funny he is. And someone else said, dude, you forgot to say how funny you are. You're hilarious. And, and so that was, it was such a helpful exercise. And so I'm going to list all the great things they said about me. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'd rather do that than what I'm about to do. And then they went, we went around the room and we would self-evaluate our weaknesses, the things that we see about ourselves that we wish weren't the way that they were, the areas in which we want to grow. And, and we would share those things with one another. And sometimes people would say, hey, you said that about yourself, but I don't really see that. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's true and you're just really good at disguising it. And sometimes people will add something else to the list. It was a very healing exercise. I mean, every one of us really benefited from that. There was, there's a culture of trust. I mean, you go to a bunch of people that don't like you and ask them how they perceive you, they're gonna give you some critical stuff. It's gonna be hard to listen to. But you go to people that, that love you, that are for you, that want to help you. This is a great, great exercise. Just take some of these questions. Now, I, I wanted to share this because uh, the list that was shared with me the list that as I self-evaluated, I, was, I wasn't the first or second or third person to go. I was fourth or fifth or sixth. And so I texted a few people. I texted Greg Johnson, who knows me very well. I texted my wife, who knows me very well. And I texted my father-in-law, who's like a dad to me, very close with him. And I asked them to, to list out the things that they saw in me that they think are great, the things that, you know, just to affirm me and the things they think, hey, you may, may need to pay attention to this. And so these are just some of the things that they shared with me. Ben, you can be opinionated. Ben, you can lose your patience with others. Ben, at times you're critical of others. Ben, your standards are too high for other people. Ben, you can be condescending at times. Now, I, I say this to let you know that I have miserably failed this text. I'm not standing up here like, I've got this on lock. I am so good. I'm, such, I'm so good at not judging people. I'm so bad at it. We all are. It's the common human experience. And so we start with these questions, asking people to interact with us in this way, or we, we surrender ourselves to God and we say, hey, God, you are my father. You love me more than anybody else on this planet. What are the ways in which I, I am like completely unaware I've got a blind spot. I've got a, a log sticking out of my eye. What is that? And we surrender those things to God. We do a searching inventory of the ways in which we perhaps have planks. And until we do, we just have no business telling other people how to live their lives. Fleming Rutledge once said, brilliant female theologian, she said, whenever we are sure that we are among the righteous, we immediately find ourselves among the arrogant. So first, Jesus invites us to shift from criticism to consecration. Next shift too, we must shift from condescension to compassion, which is verse five. We've got to take the plank out of our own eye and that, that's not it. Jesus doesn't end there. He says, and then you'll be able to see clearly to help your brother take the speck out of their eye. Removing the log from your eye isn't about ignoring the problems of other people or avoiding confrontation. You just have to do your own work first. Understanding your biases, understanding maybe in the ways in which you may not be seeing this situation or this person from the right perspective and inviting the Holy Spirit to heal you only then can you address the issues of others from a place of clarity and proportionality and wisdom. As you learn to see others more clearly, you will be amazed at how uh, your relationships improve. St. Francis of Assisi had a fear and disgust of lepers in his day. He was repulsed by them and afraid of the disease. One day while riding his horse near Assisi, he saw a man suffering from leprosy on the side of the road. Though he was repulsed by the man, he got off his horse and kissed the leper out of compassion. The leper held out his hand needing money and Francis gave him what he asked for. Then Francis got back on his horse and turned to face the man, but he was gone. There was no trace of him on the road. Francis was shaken. For him, this was a kind of theophany. He believed it was a test. For St. Francis, it was Christ himself he had kissed. 
He was transformed by this encounter, finding Christ among those for whom he previously felt disgust. He experienced the shift from condescension to compassion. Jesus took the plank out of his eye so that he could love people like Jesus loves people. Maybe you have someone in your life right now, a spouse, a child, a sibling, a parent, a friend, a boss, a roommate, and you're trying to get them to do something to change and you would literally do anything to help them, anything for them. And as a result, you are just living in this tension of being willing to do anything for them but not being able to control them. They make their own decisions. Pressure and criticism haven't worked. Giving them gifts and affirmations and attaboys and, oh, I'm going to email you. You're so great. That, that hasn't changed anything either. What Jesus is inviting us to do is to take them to the cross, bring that tension to the cross, to, to love them like Jesus loves them, to shift from condescension to compassion. That's the second shift. Next, we've got to make the third shift, the final one, from contempt to crucifixion. Paul wrote this in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, the life. I now live in the flesh. I live in faith by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God came to earth as a helpless baby and grew into a misunderstood, revered, respected, and hated man, worshiped by some, despised and rejected by others, fully man, fully God, who willingly laid out his life to be executed as a heretic and as a criminal so that we might experience the love of God. And if you have not trusted Jesus as your savior, it's as simple as saying a prayer, Jesus, I want to experience your love. I've been running from you. I've never followed you. I wanna follow you. I surrender my life to you. I wanna know this kind of love. It's amazing that Jesus, while he was here on earth, said, I did not come to condemn the world. I didn't come to judge the world, not this time around, but that through the world, that, uh, that the world might be saved through me. That's who our God is. When we entrust others to God, we entrust them to the divine love of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the God who sacrificed his Son for you and for them, the God who became human, who died as a human, who raised to new life as a human, who, who ascended into heaven, is exalted at the right hand of the Father right now as a human, which blows our minds. Like how is, I mean, as a physical body, how is that possible? And who has sent his Spirit and now lives inside of each and every one of us, the God who loves you and that person that drives you crazy. Right now, Jesus is interceding for you and the other person that did or said the thing that you just can't believe they said or did. He's preparing a place for you and that person if they've trusted Jesus. He's preparing a place for them in the new creation. And so our hearts posture from this, uh, the judgment and contempt to a heart of crucifixion to the cross of Jesus, all while carrying our own cross daily. We die daily. That's what we're, we're called to do, to take up our cross and to follow him. This cruciform life is where we all die. It's where we all drag our planks of wood that we've cut off our eye. We, we, drag, we drag them to the cross, to the foot of the cross, and we entrust others to God. We entrust ourselves to God. We entrust our past, our present, our future, and we confess we said, this is who I am. You, you know this already about me. And so I'm just telling you, Lord, we confess and we repent, which is not just saying, I'm sorry, but completely turning around and going a new direction. The cross is where we exchange the, this broken part of us, our sin, and we receive a new life, resurrection life here and now. We, we, we are dying with Christ daily, we're buried with Christ, and we are raised to new life with Christ. Not just someday when we all get to heaven, and what a day of rejoicing that will be, but now. Resurrection, life, now. Being agents of change and love and forgiveness and healing here and now. Scott McKnight says this, what Jesus does here is complex. He creates a self-awareness leading to self-judgment. This leads to humility, which in turn leads to repentance and sanctification. This leads to the kind of humility that treats other sinners with mercy. It creates a kingdom society shaped not by condemnation, but humility, love, and forgiveness. This is who we want to become. People of consecration, people of compassion, and people of crucifixion. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Father, we love you, Jesus. We love you. 
Holy Spirit, would you just speak to us right now? In this moment, we recognize that you are God, that there is no one like you, and that you love us far more than we can think or imagine. Far more than anybody that we love, you love them more. You just love us. And we wanna receive your love in a new and fresh way today, and we wanna ask you some questions. And I pray that during this time, you would speak to us, and that we would hear the loving tone that you use, not condemnation, not shaming, the deep love that you have for us. Let's, let's just, I'm gonna lead us in a, a few questions. Keep your head bowed, eyes closed. And just in these moments, open up your heart to the Lord and ask him, Father, is there any way that I have been judging people unfairly? Father, do I have a plank in my eye? And if so, what is it? Father, do I need to ask someone to forgive me for being judgmental or critical or condescending? Father, do I need to receive your forgiveness and grace for the ways in which I have been judgmental? And if that's you, maybe just respond with, yes, I receive your love, I receive your grace, I receive your forgiveness. There's no amount of work that I can do to earn your love. You love me perfectly and I receive that today. Change my heart. Last question. Do I need to offer forgiveness to someone who has wounded me? To cancel the debt. To say, they don't owe me anything. What they did hurt. Caused me pain. It took away years from my life. It isolated me. It wounded me at a deep level. But I... I can forgive them because you've forgiven me, Jesus. And I just release them in forgiveness right now. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Please continue to mold us, shape us into your image. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Everyone said, amen.